Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. President's rule has been extended for six more months in Jammu and Kashmir. The Lok Sabha has approved the extension of President's rule in Jammu and Kashmir for another six months. And the Union Home Minister has said that elections in the state will be conducted by the end of this year. So in this context, let us understand what is President's rule and its applicability for the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Because J&K enjoys a special status which has been provided by Article 370 of the Indian Constitution. So the imposition of President's rule in J&K is slightly different from the imposition of President's rule in the other states of India. Article 356 of the Indian Constitution is considered as an emergency provision which provides for the imposition of President's rule in a state. When President's rule has been imposed, it will suspend the state government and it imposes the direct rule of the central government in that state. So we need to understand under what circumstances can Article 356 be invoked by the central government for the imposition of President's rule. This emergency provision can be invoked if a state government is unable to function according to constitutional provisions. That is, if there is a failure of constitutional machinery in the state, then President's rule can be imposed in that particular state. According to the provisions of Article 356, the President of India can issue a proclamation for imposing President's rule in a state only on the basis of a report provided by the Governor which indicates that the constitutional machinery in the state has failed. So once President's rule is imposed, the executive authority in the state is exercised by the governor who is essentially appointed by the central government. The governor in turn can appoint a few administrators to assist him in carrying out the executive functions of the state. And he will also be bound by the decisions of the president of India who in turn is guided by the aid and advice of the Union Council of Ministers. So essentially, under President's rule, it is the central government which will look after the executive and administrative functions through the offices of the President and the Governor. And once President's rule is imposed, the Council of Ministers in the state, they stand dissolved and the office of the Chief Minister stands vacated. And the Legislative Assembly of the state is either dissolved or it can be kept in suspended animation until fresh elections are conducted in the state. Now let us talk about the duration for which President's rule can be imposed. Once the President proclaims the imposition of President's rule, the proclamation is valid only for a maximum of two months. And within this period, if the Government of India manages to get the approval of both the Houses of the Parliament, then President's rule can be extended for six months from the date of proclamation. And Article 356 also says that President's rule can be extended for a maximum of three years provided if it is approved by the Parliament every six months. So every six months, both the Houses of the Parliament should approve the extension of President's rule and the maximum extension can be for a period of three years from the date of proclamation. But what will happen if the Lok Sabha gets dissolved during this period? Even for this, Article 356 provides a solution. If the Lok Sabha gets dissolved during this period, then President's rule will remain valid for 30 days from the first sitting of the newly elected Lok Sabha, provided if the President's rule has been kept in continuance by the approval of the Rajya Sabha. And Article 356 was amended through the 44th Amendment Act of 1978 in order to put a restraint on the powers of the central government with regard to the proclamation of President's rule in the backdrop of the national emergency which was in place between 1975 and 1977. Because this provision has been misused by various central governments in order to target the state governments which have been formed by opposition parties so, in order to put a restraint on the powers of the central government with regard to Article 356, this emergency provision was amended through the 44th Amendment Act of 1978. According to this amendment, 
president's rule can be extended in a particular state for a period of more than one year only under the following conditions. Only if these two conditions exist, only then president's rule can be extended beyond one year by gaining the approval of both the houses of the parliament every six months. And these conditions include the existence of national emergency across the country or across the state or maybe in a part of the state. Or president's rule can be extended beyond one year if the election commission certifies that the right circumstances do not exist in the state for fresh elections to be conducted. Only under these two conditions, president's rule can be extended beyond one year by gaining the approval of both the houses of the parliament. But the maximum period for which president's rule can be imposed is three years according to Article 356. And president's rule can be revoked at any point of time by the president who is acting under the aid and advice of the Union Council of Ministers which is headed by the Prime Minister and there is no need for parliamentary approval for revoking President's rule. The imposition of President's rule under Article 356 has always been controversial because of its frequent misuse and abuse by the party which is in power at the central government. Various governments at the centre have misused this provision in order to topple the state governments which have been formed by opposition parties. In this regard, central governments have misused the office of the governor who is essentially considered as an agent of the centre and whenever there is a constitutional crisis in a particular state, especially in states which are ruled by opposition parties, the central government would direct the governor to send a report to the president stating that the constitutional machinery in the state has failed and the right circumstances have arisen for the imposition of president's rule under Article 356. So this frequent abuse of Article 356 is a direct assault on the federal structure of the Indian constitution and in order to prevent the abuse of Article 356, the Supreme Court came out with a landmark judgment in 1994 through the Bomai case and it has imposed a set of restrictions on the arbitrary impositions of President's rule. So the SR Bomai case is a landmark judgment which has restricted the misuse of Article 356 and we also had the Sarkaria Commission, which gave a report on centre-state relations in 1983. And it has recommended that Article 356 must be used very sparingly in extremely rare cases and only as a matter of last resort. The Sarkaria Commission has said that Article 356 can be invoked only when all the other alternatives have failed to prevent or rectify a breakdown of constitutional machinery in the state. In this regard, even the observations made by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar can be very important. You can use these statements while writing a mains answer. Dr. Ambedkar had observed that Article 356 should be treated like a dead letter, which means that it will be used very rarely and very sparingly. But despite these observations, Article 356 continues to be misused a number of times by the central government especially when they are targeting a state government which has been formed by opposition parties. Now, when you look at Jammu and Kashmir, apart from the imposition of president's rule under Article 356, the state has something known as governor's rule. The provision of governor's rule is unique to the state of Jammu and Kashmir because the state enjoys a special status under Article 370 of the Indian Constitution. Under Article 370, Jammu and Kashmir has a separate constitution and these temporary special provisions were given to the state by keeping in mind the difficult circumstances under which Jammu and Kashmir became a part of India. So since the state has a separate constitution and separate regulations, the imposition of central rule is slightly more nuanced in Jammu and Kashmir as compared to the imposition of president's rule in other states under Article 356. In the case of Jammu and Kashmir, if there is a failure of constitutional machinery in the state, then according to section 92 of the Jammu and Kashmir constitution, first the governor's rule has to be imposed even before president's rule can be imposed under article 356. Section 92 of the JNK constitution says that imposition of governor's rule is mandatory and it can be imposed for a period of six months 
by obtaining the consent of the president of India. So according to section 92, six months of governor's rule is compulsory according to the JNK constitution. And during governor's rule, all the legislative and executive powers of the state are vested with the governor. The governor in turn is assisted by few administrators in executing his responsibilities. But of course, he is finally answerable to the president of India according to the Indian constitution. And the president in turn is bound by the aid and advice of the Union Council of Ministers. But please remember that when governor's rule is in place in Jammu and Kashmir, the legislative powers, financial powers and budgetary powers, they are all vested with the governor who will exercise these powers with the help of few administrators. After the expiry of six months of governor's rule, it can be either extended with the approval of the Indian president or the central government can then request the president to proclaim president's rule under article 356 of the Indian constitution. So if president's rule is imposed under article 356, that is after the expiry of six months of governor's rule, then the powers of legislation and administration will get transferred to the central government and the parliament. The legislative powers and budgetary powers will be exercised by the parliament whereas the executive and administrative powers will be exercised by the President of India who will be guided by the Union Council of Ministers. Now let's look at a series of articles on the ongoing G20 summit. In the first page we have an article which says that President Trump and Prime Minister Modi have held a fruitful discussion on the sidelines of the ongoing G20 summit in Osaka, Japan. The two leaders have held a fruitful discussion on some of the pressing issues in India's relations with United States. Reportedly, they have discussed the trade differences and there are indications coming out from this meet that these trade differences might be resolved because President Trump has promised a very big trade deal with India which might resolve some of these differences in the area of trade and commerce. And both the leaders have acknowledged the breadth and the depth of bilateral ties between India and US, which extends to very strong relations with regard to economic ties, trade and commerce, energy, defense and security, counter-terrorism, space, etc. They have acknowledged the strong and intimate relations between the two countries and Prime Minister Modi has committed to further deepen the economic and cultural relations with the United States. And Prime Minister Modi has also brought up the crisis in the Persian Gulf, which refers to the ongoing tensions between US and Iran and its likely impact on India. Prime Minister Modi has said that even though Iran was supplying around 11 to 12 percent of India's crude oil requirement, India has still reduced the oil imports from Iran because of US demand. So he has brought up the energy security concerns of India. He has also mentioned the well-being of the Indian diaspora in the Persian Gulf and in the Middle East who might be threatened by any possibility of conflict between US and Iran or maybe between Iran and other regional rivals such as Saudi Arabia and Israel. So any conflict in the Persian Gulf and in the Middle East will have a huge impact on the well-being of the Indian diaspora. This will also affect the flow of investments into India because the Middle Eastern countries are one of the major investors in the Indian economy. This can even affect the flow of remittances that is being sent back by the Indian diaspora to their families back in India because these remittances are very crucial to bridge India's current account deficit. Next, in another article on page 13, it has been reported that Prime Minister Modi has held an informal meeting with the BRICS leaders on the sidelines of the ongoing G20 summit. During this informal interaction between the BRICS leaders, Prime Minister Modi has highlighted three major challenges for the global community. According to the Indian Prime Minister, the first major challenge which is being faced with the global community is the instability and slowdown in the global economy. The Indian Prime Minister has said that the instability in the global economy is a direct outcome of the rising unilateralism, protectionism and competitiveness which is a direct outcome of the trade wars 
that have been unleashed by the United States. And this has overshadowed the rules-based multilateral trading system which was built by the World Trade Organization. By highlighting this issue, the Prime Minister has clearly shown that India is on the side of multilateralism in the conflict between unilateralism and multilateralism. This also shows that when it comes to issues of global trade, India clearly stands with the developing world and it will look to protect its national interests or self-interests even at the cost of opposing the developed world which is led by the United States. This also highlights the fact that India is constantly putting an effort to strike a balance in its relations with the United States and other major powers such as Russia and China. And in areas where there is a conflict between the developed world and the developing world, India will always side with the developing world even at the cost of opposing close allies such as the United States. And the second challenge, according to Prime Minister Modi, is the need to promote sustainable development and inclusive development by keeping in mind the impact of global warming and climate change and especially developing countries need to focus on inclusive and sustainable development by keeping in mind the social inequalities which exist in their respective societies. And the third challenge highlighted by Prime Minister Modi is the threat posed by terrorism to global stability and economic development. He has said that terrorism is the biggest threat to humanity and there is an urgent need to jointly cooperate to fight against all forms of terrorism. Next, we have a very important article on page 13 which brings up the technology-related disputes that have come up at the G20 summit. These disputes are related to two issues in particular and they have divided the global powers with US and Japan on one side and the BRICS countries on the other side. The issues are related to the topic of data storage and the rollout of 5G technology. First, let us talk about the dispute related to data storage. Since Japan is hosting the G20 summit, it had proposed an initiative known as Data Free Flow with Trust. And through this initiative, Japan was looking to create a regulatory framework for regulating data storage. Basically, Japan and US they wanted a global framework to be worked out to regulate data storage under the G20. But India, along with the BRICS countries, have opposed this move and they want regulations related to data storage to be handled at the World Trade Organization instead of the G20. Because the WTO is a multilateral organization which has global participation, whereas G20 is restricted to 20 major economies of the world. And G20 is largely dominated by the developed countries and that is one reason why India along with the other BRICS countries are opposed to discussing data storage at the G20 and they want the issue to be taken up at a multilateral forum such as WTO. This conflict highlights the fact that data today has emerged as a source of wealth. Today, data is being considered as wealth and that's the reason why global powers are looking to gain control over the regulation of data storage. And according to reports, this initiative of Japan was taken up at the G20 as a direct response to India's efforts in mandating data localization. Recently, the Reserve Bank of India had made it mandatory for various payment service providers to store all financial data which is generated in India on data servers which is located within India. So this was an effort of the RBI to mandatorily push for data localization with regard to financial payments. Plus India has also proposed a draft data protection bill which is also introducing the concept of data localization for social media companies and all the technology companies which are handling and processing data belonging to Indian citizens. So since data is being considered as wealth in today's world, the data generated by the Indian citizens should be treated as sovereign property of the Indian government. 
So that's the reason why India has been pushing for data localization. But this move has been opposed by the multinational corporations such as Google, Mastercard, Visa, Amazon, etc. These companies have raised the issue with the US government and they have labeled these efforts at data localization as a type of non-tariff barrier which is creating an unfair disadvantage for American companies. So the US government has labeled data localization as a non-tariff barrier and it is opposed to data localization because according to the US government, it restricts the flow of digital trade, it violates privacy and intellectual property protections. The next issue is with regard to the rollout of 5G technology across the world. We have already discussed this issue. The United States is opposed to the involvement of Huawei in the introduction of 5G technology because various governments believe that Huawei is very closely linked to the Chinese PLA and the Chinese intelligence. It is believed that Huawei is misusing its dominant position in the field of technology and communication and it is creating deliberate backdoors in the communication networks which are being installed across the world so that Chinese intelligence and the People's Liberation Army can access sensitive and classified data belonging to the target governments. So according to the US and various other developed countries, involvement of Huawei in the rollout of new technology is a major cyber security threat. Even the Indian government believes that Huawei can pose a cyber security threat. But with regard to the rollout of 5G technology, India has still not decided whether to involve Huawei in introducing 5G technology to India. The US has already made it very clear to countries such as India and various other European countries that they should not allow the involvement of Huawei in the rollout of 5G technology. And if they violate these directions of the US government, the US has threatened to cut off all intelligence and defense cooperation with these countries. But at the G20 summit, India has not provided any assurances or commitments to the US about keeping Huawei out of India's 5G sector because India is still trying to weigh its options. Because if India keeps Huawei out of the 5G networks, then definitely China will protest this and this could affect India's relations with China as well. So experts believe that India should capitalize on 5G technology without getting caught in the technology cold war which is going on between the US and China. India should look to fulfill its national interests of capitalizing on 5G technology without choosing sides between the US and China. Now let's take up the next article. The Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog, Mr. Rajiv Kumar, has said that India's National Electric Mobility Mission Plan is well thought out and he has countered the charges brought up by the automobile industry, which has been critical of the deadlines that have been laid out by the National Electric Mobility Mission Plan and the industry has labelled these deadlines as unrealistic. So as a response to these charges raised by the automobile industry, the Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog has said that the plan has been well thought out and it has been designed to achieve India's national interests and the government is looking to work with the industry in order to achieve these ambitious objectives. So in this context, first let us talk about the National Electric Mobility Mission Plan. This was an ambitious program which was launched by the government of India in 2013 in order to achieve national fuel security. As a part of this mission plan, the government had laid out an ambitious target to switch from internal combustion engines to hybrid and electric vehicles. So this switch from diesel and petrol vehicles to hybrid and electric vehicles will help India achieve national fuel security or energy security and the target of the government is to achieve around 6 to 7 million sales of hybrid and electric vehicles from the year 2020 onwards. So from 2020 onwards, the government is planning to achieve a sale of around 6 to 7 million hybrid and electric vehicles every year. And according to the Niti Aayog, this transition 
will help India save crude oil worth around 62,000 crore rupees. This will translate to huge financial savings as well. And the government is also ready to provide fiscal and monetary incentives to the automobile industry in order to enable them to develop the technology which is needed to introduce hybrid and electric vehicles in the country. So a dedicated scheme known as FAME India was launched under the National Electric Mobility Mission Plan 2020 in order to provide for fiscal and monetary incentives. FAME India stands for Faster Adoption and Manufacturing of Hybrid and Electric Vehicles. This ambitious program is being implemented by the Department of Heavy Industries. But there are a number of roadblocks which exist in the realization of this ambitious objectives. So let us look at some of the challenges in the introduction of hybrid and electric vehicles in the country. First and foremost, the biggest challenge would be indigenous technology development, especially the development of battery technology. This is where considerable investments have to be made by the automobile industry. They need to invest a lot of capital in research and development to develop indigenous battery technology which is needed to introduce hybrid and electric vehicles in India. The second challenge for the industry and the government would be to create a market for hybrid and electric vehicles. There should be adequate incentives provided to the customers in order to push them to abandon petrol and diesel vehicles and switch to electric and hybrid vehicles. And the third challenge would be the creation of charging infrastructure across the country. And this would require close collaboration between the government and the automobile industry. But if India manages to surpass these challenges, and if the government manages to work along with the industry, and if the industry cooperates with the government, then there are tremendous advantages for India by realizing these ambitious objectives of the National Electric Mobility Mission Plan. It will help India to save on its crude oil imports. It will help India achieve energy security by reducing its import dependency. India's energy security will no longer be determined by global geopolitical developments, especially in the Middle East. And the reduction in imports will also reduce India's current account deficit. It will also help us reduce our emissions and help us meet our targets under the Paris Agreement of the Climate Change Convention. It will help India to combat air pollution and this will automatically translate into a number of health benefits. Now, if you look at the editorial page, we have an editorial related to the topic of Maratha's reservation and we have a column related to the water crisis in Chennai. Both the topics have been comprehensively covered in the previous sessions and there is nothing new to be discussed in these editorials and columns. So you can kindly go back and watch those analysis to understand the topic of Maratha reservation and the water crisis in Chennai. So let us take up the practice questions for today. Which of the following parts in the Indian constitution provides for emergency provisions? The correct answer is option B. It is part 18 of the Indian constitution which contains the emergency provisions. Now let's take up the second question. Which of the following committees dealt with data protection? The correct answer is option C, Justice Sri Krishna Committee. Let's look at the third question. Which of the following institutions has recently transferred advanced battery technology to the automobile industry to help India achieve its ambitious targets under the National Electric Mobility Mission Plan? The correct answer is option D, ISRO. Now let's take up another practice question. The term Dragonfly Mission, which was recently seen in news, refers to a NASA mission to send a drone to Saturn's moon, which is Titan. So option A is the correct answer. So instead of a map-based question for today, we have taken up a bonus prelims practice question. Now let's take up a question from the 2017 prelims paper. The term digital single market strategy seen in the news refers to the European Union. Option C is the correct answer. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. Article 356 violates the federal nature of the Indian constitution.
critically evaluate. The second question, discuss the geopolitical aspects of the introduction of 5G technology in relation to India. So please take up these questions and write an answer and post your answers in the comment section below. This concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.